Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. Exchanges in Toronto and New York saw declines with the Nasdaq really taking it on the chin. He tells us the major big tech firms that have been powering the Nasdaq finally hit declines. Oil had its fourth largest drop since the 80s. However, gold and silver were bright spots. Ross also has a special offer for our listeners. Robert Campbell, publisher of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter, checks in from San Diego to talk extensively about real estate, inflation, U.S. immigration patterns, and on how to get your personal affairs in order. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always a pleasure, Jim. Well, if things couldn't be called interesting in New York and Toronto on the stock exchanges... On Friday, I don't know how else you would describe it. <laughs> yeah, do you want volatility or not? Uh, gosh, uh, you know, here we are. You've got uh, you get bad breaks and good recoveries, and then worse breaks and uh, recoveries. But uh, closed off the week at uh, one of the worst levels that we've seen. What in six weeks now? Um, right, you got Toronto down two percent on the day. The S and P down one. Nasdaq down two percent. And that's to finish off a week that wasn't very good anyway. So, uh, you know, we've, we've had this divergence as far as the new highs and new lows was concerned, uh, that led up to, uh, the rolling top. You have the advanced decline lines, which had not looked good. So this kind of break was really, you know, it was sort of in the cards. And the question is now, um, you know, we're down on um, the broad indices about four and a half to five percent, and um, we typically look at five and a half percent as a reasonable support area. Eleven uh, percent is uh, one that uh, you might get on a really hard break. So, uh, as we move into um, what you know, a lot of people want to see here is uh, the Santa Claus rally to take us into year end. Um, well, we've got it oversold enough at this point that a reversal would be interesting. If we could go take out this week's high, uh, it might have enough uh, power to do that. But uh, any follow through on the downside right now, and uh, I think it could uh, gain a little bit more momentum uh, before we can put in a decent low. The uh, you know we take a look at things like the credit spreads; um, they've been widening out. And uh, once that starts to happen, uh, you can get a lot of volatility, and typically the rallies that come out of uh, any type of a, a break, like a breakout, like we've seen in the credit spreads, any rally in the equity markets tends to be um, reasonably short-lived. They can be quick and hard, but uh, they're reasonably short-lived as you then roll over for um, a further decline. The Nasdaq took the biggest hit on Friday. Uh, what's behind that, and uh, are the big names that were holding up the index uh, taking it on the chin now? Well, yeah, we've uh, seen a, pro a progression here. The um, so the, the innovative stocks um, had been the ones that um, were really the leaders into the first half of the year, and then they started to roll over. But the big cap names that were uh, yeah, it had really, you know, the big earnings, et cetera, the, the Apples, the Amazons of this world. Those were continuing to make the index go up, but internally, 
you were getting more than half of the stocks in the index that weren't doing well. But because of their capitalization weighted indices, the indices looked better than the average stock. And so if you, if you want to do a comparison here, and I love to do these, um, when you look back to the dot-com bubble of 95 through 2000, uh, as we went into the first quarter of 2000, though those dot-comers uh, blew out on the top end, um, settled back and uh, formed a bit of a distribution pattern through um, July into August and then broke their support levels as we moved into September. Now, the reason I bring this up is that if you take a look at the similar stocks, which would be part of the ARK Innovation ETF, that's A-R-K-K, um, that has the same pattern. It, it peaked out here in the first quarter of this year, rolled over, tested support a few times, and this week it has broken down through its key support level, just like we saw the dot-com NASDAQ stocks do in 2000. So, um, you know, that exuberance that was out there has clearly run its course at this point. Um, so, you know, bounces in those stocks are definitely still to be sold uh, because I think there's still quite a bit more left on the downside. Now, we saw the Canadian banks uh, announce uh, major profits, and all of them announced that they're going to do major share buybacks. Shouldn't they keep some of that money for a rainy day, considering the market's looking a little toppy and choppy now? Oh, well, you would hope so, but uh, you know <laughs> what they're trying to do is keep the investors happy, and everybody had been promised that once the uh, uh, we got past this uh, period of uh, austerity in the banks uh, from the regulatory uh, bodies that there would be these uh, big buybacks and there would be the increases of distribution. So they've really had to do it to keep investors happy. But even at that, um, most of them um, have uh, really not held up, well, put it this way, They've held around their highs, but they don't have any momentum left on the upside. So this has been the, the classic of, you know, buy mystery and sell history because the, the, the story is an old one. It's been a page one story for quite a while. And uh, finally, um, the, uh, they put the exclamation mark uh, after it to say that, uh, you know, everything's in place and aren't, uh, aren't things just perfect right now. How bad was crude oil's tumble? Uh, okay, so the the break in oil was an 11% break, um, that hard one down to $66, and that was the uh, the uh, fourth fastest decline that oil has had in the history that we've got back in through the 1980s. So that type of break, um, what you usually see is uh, a bounce out of that, and we had a little bit of a recovery this week, um, early in early in the week, and then uh, settling back down again. It would take quite a while for oil to find a bottom and try to do something decently. However, uh, the stocks, and if uh, you look at the big-name stocks, the Exxons, the Chevrons, the ConocoPhillips, um, they are holding in pretty well this week after the hard break, and that's very common when you've had an uptrend in oil with a, a severe break as we have seen. Um, the same type of thing can be said for uh, you know, most of the Canadian oil patch. The uh, 20-week moving average that we look at uh, has been a key support for a lot of those, and uh, it's you know it's on these kind of moves that you really look to see where is the relative strength, which ones are holding up the best versus the, the weak one. Um, we're bound to get some capitulation signals on some of the weaker ones, so you'd want to stay. Uh, away from those as an investment vehicle, they're, they're good for a tradable bounce, but really what you want to be looking to buy are the ones that have the uh, the best uh, relative strength during this um, period of a sell-off. Now, was it all bad news on the markets? No. Uh, the one area that has uh, been under pressure uh, has been the precious metals for the last month and a half. And, uh, you know, that came about when um, the, uh, the silver market, uh, in particular, we look at, had been unable to uh, rally into new highs uh, along with the um, uh, all the other commodities. When we take a look at the CRB index, Commodity Research Bureau index, 
Uh, it had a big overbought monthly RSI, and it had a, just a, a couple of great runs, and uh, silver wasn't participating at all. And that type of move generally will give you um, a good solid break in the silver, which we have seen. Silver dropped down to uh, $23 after a, a nice run up um, a couple of, or a month, month and a half ago. So we've seen an initial break. We got down into good oversold territory for both gold and silver, and we're at a point of the year, uh, seasonally, where you will find a uh, typically a November-December low, especially in gold, and uh, from there a decent recovery uh, that will carry you in through into uh, January and sometimes beyond. Um, looking back, um, since 1975, since Americans have been allowed once again to own gold, um, 80% of those years we saw this type of a rally. And um, what you want to look for is an oversold. So we look at the relative strength index. It went down and got oversold early part of this week on the daily chart, made a nice reversal off the bottom. And so you're getting your first uptick there. Uh, to show that there's some buoyancy coming back in. Um, we look at our sequential model, uh, which uh, gave signals uh, in the middle of the week to say that it was getting uh, fully uh, uh, completed as far as an initial break was concerned, and the same thing was happening in silver. So the reversal that we saw on Thursday, Friday, uh, probably has some pretty good legs in it at this point. Uh, we would uh, look for uh, stops probably 2 to 3% below the lows we put in this week and um, should see a pretty decent move. Um, the, the miners are questionable uh, because if the equity market still hasn't found a bit of a hole uh, of a support in here, miners might get held back. And I notice uh, uh, as we finished off this week, um, gold was outpacing silver, and both of those were outpacing the, the GDX and the GDXJ uh, ETFs. So um, you're probably best off uh, to own the bullion right now uh, for the play on the upside. Ross, in these interesting times, perhaps you can offer some help to our listeners. Well, we're going to continue on for another week here with uh, 25% off the subscription for uh, an annual subscription for new subscribers. And uh, we always have that uh, special two-month offer for anyone who wants to take a look at, uh, you know, just testing the waters and see what uh, our service is like. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Good to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. We now travel off to San Diego next to chat with Robert Campbell. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Robert Campbell, author of Timing the Real Estate Market and the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter. You can find him online at realestatetiming.com. He's speaking to us from San Diego. Bob, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thank you very much. When will the next issue of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter be published? Well, the, the, the most current issue was November 15th, 2021, and it was just... Uh, uh, sent out to my, all my subscribers um, the in the middle of November. So the next one will be published in the middle of, of January because I publish it. Uh, it's a 10-page letter, and I publish it every two months. You have a live event coming up in the new year. What's going on there? Oh, this, it, it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's my follow-up seminar to a seminar I gave in October about um, um, inflation is rising and what you should do about it. Because that's uh, that's a very very timely topic nowadays, because the majority of people 
get get hurt very badly during uh, periods of high and rising inflation. So where is it and when? Oh, that's at, that's going to be on March nineteenth, twenty twenty two, at the La Jolla Marriott in San Diego. Live event, live event. No mask, no vaccine passports, no social distancing. Just 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 good old boys all getting together. And I'm and that based on the last seminar I had. Um, no mention will ever be made of, of COVID, unless this whole thing just blows up in our face, which the uh, everybody seems to want it to do, and we shut down the world again. Is inflation a hidden tax? Oh, absolutely. And it, it and, and what makes it what makes it so dangerous, and and why the media doesn't report on it, Jim, is because inflation is something that happens year after year decade after decade um, that and it's not something that just happens to be happening at any given point in time so it's relentless what it does to you because that there's there's three things that make that make you know that holding on to maintain the purchasing power of the money you have difficult one is inflation two is changing market conditions and three is taxation so if, if you're just, if you, if you're happy enough, let's say, and you know, I go back, you know, you know, 50 years where I've studied traders and rich people and how they made money and investors and all that stuff. And you know, at some point in time they decide to retire. And then they say, okay, let's say I retire with uh, five million dollars, let's say. Now the point is, how do I make, which is, which, which will, which will afford you a very comfortable retirement, you know, for the rest of your life. How do I maintain that comfort for the rest of my life? How do I do that with with inflation, changing market conditions, and taxation having to overcome those things? And that's a difficult task. I know I know they never teach this in college or anything like that. And that's why one of these days, you know, I may I may decide to start teaching classes at UCLA or UC somewhere. And it's going to be based on what happens in the real world from somebody that's lived in the real world for, you know, and, and, you know, for the last 50 years and, and navigated the good times and the bad times and the taxation and what it's really like. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, one of my subscribers, and he said, Bob, you ought to be teaching that class. And I talked to him for about 10 minutes, and he said, none of that is ever taught at the university. And I go, I know. And he said, how helpful do you think that would be to kids? He goes, that education would be invaluable. For somebody like yourself to tell people, here's what the real world is like, as opposed to the, you know, the, the theoretical world that these guys live in, and it's being taught by professors that, you know, have never, you know, have never probably spent one day out in the real world um, doing the kind of things they're teaching for themselves. How bad is inflation now, and how bad could it possibly get? Well, it's bad now. It's, you know, it's over 6% a year, you know, based on CP. Th- th- these are the government, uh, what the government reports, which is clearly understated, everybody. I mean, it's, it's in the government's best interest, you know, to keep the inflation numbers low because a lot of the contracts that the government's uh, involved in, as well as Social Security, they're all, they're all geared or keyed to... Um, um, the, the rising cost of inflation. So in other words, that I think last year, I think I got a 5.9% increase in my Social Security payment um, because of inflation, when in reality, does 5.9% cover it? No, it does not. In, in reality, the inflation rate is at least 2, maybe even 3 or 4% higher than that. But if all of a sudden the government had to pay me an extra 10% per year for Social Security versus 5.9 and multiply that by 78 million baby boomers, we're talking about a lot of money. So instead of the current budget deficit being $3 trillion a year, if, if, in, if inflation, you know, bumped up those Social Security payments by 10% as opposed to 5.9, the deficit would probably be, be $4 trillion a year or somewhere around there. And that all adds up. And, and, and that's the situation that we're in right now in the United States where the government has to print money in order just to cover, even to cover entitlements for baby boomers and interest on the national debt because it has grown so large. Other things like defense and running the government, that's all was printed money right now. That is not covered by tax receipts. So that's why that's why in 2020 we ran a three trillion dollar deficit. In 2021 we're going to run a three trillion dollar deficit, 
and that that I can't see any way that we can even stop these stop these deficits, you know, from happening. Oh, we can stop them for sure. We could live within our means. You know, we we could cut back on the entitlements to the baby boomers, or default on our national debt payments, or or or, or cut back on national debt, something like that. We could do those kind of things, but that would be devastating to the economy and and to the population as a whole. Are there comparisons between inflation today and inflation in the seventies? Well, sure, inflation's inflation, and you know, and and what's what's so uh, different about this? is most people haven't seen this kind of inflation in 50 years, in 50 years. And, you know, so nobody's prepared for it. And they don't know what to expect. But somebody like myself that's 74 years old, I lived through that inflation. So, so not only am I, uh, am I uh, an economist, but I have personal experience in living through those inflations. And, of course, when I lived through those, those inflations, I, those were totally different times, everybody. You know, back in the let me let me say back the standard of living back in the seventies when I graduated from UCLA, I that I could have got a good job and if I worked hard I could have bought a home close to the beach in 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 Southern California, w- without that much trouble. Today, fifty years later, if you graduate for college and and work two jobs, maybe you can afford the rent. That's how things have changed nowadays, and this is this is all going to change, of course, because this is this is totally unsustainable. The path that we're on right now, and I can guarantee you that that things are going to adjust back to normal one way or another, and and and, and those adjustments back to normal are going to mean you know falling asset prices and opportunity for those people who were smart enough to to get you know to sell high and then be in a position to buy back low. Um, at the bottom of the next cycle. Sure, and, and I can recall the 70s as well. I just got into the workforce in 1975. Two weeks after my 18th birthday, I was working full-time in radio and going to high school. Try that trick. You couldn't get a credit card, though, until you were 25 years old. I know. I mean, And now you have 12-year-olds with three credit cards. Yeah, you look back and you say that I tell today, you know, in, in the in the old days, you know, that the guys like myself, the older guys, the older generation, you know, used to say, you know, boy, when I was a kid, I had it much harder than you guys. You know, I had to walk four miles, you know, through the snow, back and forth to school, and milk the cows before I went, and blah blah blah. What I tell kids nowadays is that I have it so much easier than you guys. I got out of school. I could have got a job making twelve thousand dollars a year. I could have bought a home near the coast here in Southern California, a nice area for sixty, sixty-five thousand bucks. And I was buying good used cars every year, and I had no college debt. UCLA cost me two hundred dollars a quarter for tuition, and I joined a fraternity where it was four hundred dollars room and board. Oh, that's a bargain. And you know that kids like myself that work. I worked on my dad's construction sites during the summer. So I always made two or three times more money than um, all my all my other buddies that that had to you know scrape bugs off a windshield in gas stations. One because I had a skilled job and they didn't. So I always drove nice cars, drive nice, nicer cars than everybody. But my parents paid for half my college and I paid for half. I don't know anybody that that needed to get a college loan. So the it's so different nowadays, and it's it's got to be discouraging for these young these young kids. And I'm sure it is. I mean, what's the American dream? That, to, to, to have a good enough job where you can afford the rent here in Southern California? I mean, a one-bedroom apartment here in San Diego costs an average of $1,700 a month. $1,700 a month. And that's after tax. Even if you're making thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars a year, you're not making much more than, I mean, thirty, thirty-five hundred dollars a month. You're not making much more than two thousand dollars a month after tax. And so you can barely afford the rent by yourself. Now you got to move in with three or four other guys, you know, all during your 20s and, and that kind of stuff, and just to get by. So these are difficult times. And, that, and that's what explains, of course, the, why the, uh, the, the number of kids between the ages of 30, uh, 20, and 30 years old in the United States um, has increased from like 48%, a high 48% figure uh, two years ago, to over 52% today. These young kids, when I went to college, Jim, we didn't come home. 
The kids didn't come home. Nowadays, 52% of them come home. That's a, that shows you how difficult these times are. We'll have more with Robert Campbell right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Robert Campbell. Are the ongoing economic problems in Argentina caused by inflation? Oh, absolutely. And corruption. Heavy, heavy corruption in Argentina. One of the more corrupt, you know, uh, governments in the world. So, but in, and also they inflate, when they get in trouble, they just inflate the money supply. And they, they, they've had, they've had, you know, an, a, a currency crisis probably that averages once, once every ten years or more, where everybody gets smashed. So it's, it's Argentina is the worst. And if you read stories about Argentina, Ar, and what's interesting about Argentina is the, the currency there is the peso, but serious business like a mortgage on a house that's not conducted in the peso because that stuff can go worthless in no time flat. The, the, sec, the currency that, that, that all serious transactions occur in with, with lending money and stuff is U.S. dollar. So that's their fallback. It's the U.S. dollar. And of course, Argentina in the early 80s, their solution to their economic problems then was to invade the Falkland Islands. And Maggie Thatcher sent the British Navy and cleared that problem up pretty quick. And the people in Argentina, because of the government censorship, had no idea they were losing the battle. Their newspaper headlines were saying this aircraft carrier's been sunk, so many British planes have been shot down. None of it true. I, I, I had a friend that I knew a guy that was born and raised in Argentina, and he lived there uh, up through his 20s and came to the United States and went to college and got a Ph.D. in something and has a really good job right now. And so we became friends, and I asked him, I said, in all South America, if, if you had to put your money in one country, and leave it there untouched for 10 years, what country would that be? He said, Chile. I said, if there's one country that you wouldn't, that the last country you'd put your money in and leave it there for 10 years, what would that be? He said, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that comes from guys that's lived through that stuff there, you know. He's, this isn't textbook stuff from, from, a, from a college course. This is a kid that actually lived through it. And, and he said, that's been really, really difficult on those people. And what's interesting, everybody, is you go back like maybe 50 years, Argentina was like the, the eighth best economy in the world. And it, what that shows you, what that shows you, everybody, is nothing's permanent in life. Everything is transitory. Pain is transitory. Pleasure is transitory. Booms are transitory. Bus are transitory, and you know the, the solid economic base of countries is is transitory. Because everything, the economic principle called entropy, everything self destructs in the long run, and and, that, and and that's what we are all fighting, you know, as individuals, you know, to like stay ahead of the curve for our life, so at least we're li we we can live a, a healthy and comfortable. Um, lifestyle, and you know, and don't worry about being the richest man in the world, because the chance of that happening is almost zero, and that almost almost depends on pure luck anyway. Yeah, as much chance as me marrying into the royal family. Do the stock <laughs> markets? Do the stock markets look like they are topping or correcting? Well, you know that they, they sure they sure have been volatile lately, of course. And they're not going up at the pace that they were, you know, in the previous year. However, the Federal Reserve is, is will come to the rescue. Because right now, um, tax receipts in the United States have never been higher than they are today. And why is that with a, with a you know, not a super strong economy? It's based on 50%, over 50% of tax receipts are based on capital gains. And with housing prices at record highs and stock stock prices at record highs, anybody that sells a stock owes a big capital gain, you know, on you know, on the profit they made, and that's and that's what's that's what's you know feeding into U.S. tax receipts. 
If the stock market were to fall 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% like it did in 2008, if U.S. housing were to fall 35% like, like it did during 2005, 2006, which I think it's going to do, we're in a world of hurt. Because all of a sudden the tax receipts are going to go down 50%. And, and, and right now, even with tax receipts at record highs, the U.S. is running, ta- running budget deficits of $3 trillion a year. If you should cut those, if you should cut those um, tax receipts in half, we're going to start running budget deficits of 5 or $6 trillion a year, which, of course, has its own consequences, like a collapse of the currency. So, you know, you know one of my three principles, one of my... Only uh, three principles only that has any value in in the study of economics is there's no economic free lunch, and that's it. So all of a sudden you start you st- the Fed has to like you know you know that um, um, rev up the printing machines in order to keep the wheels on the cart. What you're going to see is you're going to see the purchasing you're going to see inflation roar ahead, the, the 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 value of the currency decline, and it's it's going to be even worse for Americans than it is right now. Fed Chair Jay Powell seems to be giving mixed signals to the markets regarding further money printing. Is further money printing likely to be good for the stock markets? Yes, and it's likely to be. It, it, it's likely to be good for the stock market. It's likely to be good for real estate market. It's likely to be good for all asset prices because over the years, in, in, in the study of inflation, I've become a monetarist. And what a monetarist is, that's, what a monetarist is, he, he believes that, that inflation is a matter of supply and demand. And not some of these concocted and, and concocted theories about inflation, that it's velocity of money and, and, you know, and, and, and supply shortages and, you know, spikes in demand and things that, that cause inflation. The simplest explanation is pure supply and demand. And that is that the, when there's more money, chasing an equal number of goods and services, the price of those goods and services go up. And that's it. And that's, that's exactly what we're experiencing right now. We, ha- we have an extra $6 trillion in the economy that was injected into the economy in cash in the last two years. And while at the same time, the, 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 the production of, of goods and services, the, the, the quantity, supply of goods and services has gone down, you know, because of the, the lockdowns and, and you know, um, and, and, and shortages with transportation. So we have the worst of all. We have the perfect recipe right now for inflation. You know, too much money, not enough goods and services. So when that's going to change, you know, nobody knows. So all you can do is just monitor key indicators that show you when that's going to change and then reposition your portfolio so that you're, you're more likely to, you know, maintain what you have, uh, if not, you know, um, profit from the opportunity that's ahead. The last thing you want to do is sit there in an asset class that's going to go down, and you and you go down with the ship. That's that's why one of my favorite people in life, favorite authors, is Charles Darwin. He said, he said, you know, success doesn't go to the strongest or the most intelligent. It goes to those who 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 most success, successfully adjust to change, and that's what it's all about, guys. You just, you have to be, the, the, the three key words are adjust, adjust, adjust. Is that hard work? You're damn right it's hard work. It's really hard work. But that's what it takes. That's what it gets, takes to get ahead in life and stay ahead in life. Inflation meets the real estate bubble. What could we see happen to real estate? Well, this is, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and that's, and I address that, of course, I address that in every issue of my time, real estate timing letter. But the last issue that, and I did something that, that, that I don't, I've never read before or seen before and showed, and showed my followers information that, you know, that you can't find from any other source. I went back to, um, 45 years and looked at what the government reports for inflation. And above that, I put a chart of what mortgage rates were, you know, and how they adjusted to changing rates of inflation. And what I found was this. Over the course of the last 45 years, mortgage rates typically carried a three percentage point premium above the rate of inflation, which makes sense. I mean, you're not going to loan, if inflation's at 6%, are you going to loan your money to somebody for 30 years at 3% like we're doing right now? No. I mean, your guaranteed loss 
of 4% per year on your money. Only an idiot would do that, or the Federal Reserve Board that's buying that kind of debt. So based on that kind of, that kind of spread, three, three percentage points above the rate of inflation, the, rate, the, the most current rate of inflation is around 6.2%. Add three points, three percentage points to that. That means U.S. mortgage rates, based based on based on the, the records of history, should be above nine percent. Where are they? Three percent. Now, that's just manipulation by the Fed. You know, that's why the Fed's buying up all these mortgages. That, that's why we are completely we are completely on on life support by the Federal Reserve System. If if market forces were allowed to dictate you know, dictate by themselves where mortgage rates should be, they should definitely be at 8 and maybe even 9%. And what would that do to a, a real estate bubble, a, a real estate uh, boom that's even greater than the last real estate boom? That means that the next downturn is going to be as epic. This, the coming downturn is going to be as epic as the last one. That's what I, that's what I believe. Inflation's the big story right now, yet gold and silver don't seem to care. What do you think's going on there? Well, I know that's 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 always a good question and I've studied that over the years and people that know people that know gold and silver that really know it know that it's it's it has always been manipulated by the government, Jim. For one thing, a vote for gold is a vote against the government and they don't like that. That's why they, they, they keep it artificially low. But at some point in time, like if we get inflation, what, interestingly, if you go, if you study that the inflationary episodes of the past, and when inflation gets above four percent, two asset classes shine above all others: gold and silver. So it's coming. What kind of financial repercussions could we be facing from the COVID coerced injections and vaccine passports narrative? What, what I think. <coughs> Like in L.A., for example, the city of L.A. is trying to I- invoke uh, mandates that unless you're vaccinated, you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to a gym, and you can't go to a lot of businesses. Okay, let's not try to theorize too much. Let's just look at this on a, on a, on a, on a very, very, you know, base level and say, what's that, what's that going to do to your business? If you ran a, a restaurant, for example, and you lost 50% of your clients, What's going to happen to your business, Jim? It's going to be destroyed. You don't have a business. Or what happens to a gym? Or what happens to any other business? Russia tried that a couple of years ago. They said, you can't go to a restaurant unless, unless you have a, uh, uh, can prove you were vaccinated. That mandate lasted about two months. You know why? No, everybody stopped going to restaurants. So, you know, there are, you know, automatic adjustments to the system that that will prevent, you know, this kind of thing from happening. Or if you just want to do that and and say, oh, you lose half your business, then the Federal Reserve can can print money up and give it to the business and give it to the business, you know, to, um, um, uh, to take care of the shortfall. Of course, now all these businesses are doing half the business, but they got the same amount of money. There goes inflation again. So, you know, you're not going to produce more dinners if only 50% of the, 50% of the clients are there, but everybody has just as much money. So there goes inflation. There's no free lunch in economics, everybody. And wh- wh- whether it happens in the short term or in the long term, that rule will always prevail. There, in other words, there are always consequences to every action that you take. What's the latest on California real estate? California real estate is still doing extremely well. I mean, the, the, it's, it's probably as a state, it probably has, it's in the top 20%, uh, if not the top 10% of the fastest, uh, of the fastest appreciating real estate in the country. So it's doing really, really well. Florida looks like the state where freedom reigns. Is this showing up in Florida real estate prices? Not really. Tampa's, you know, I follow two cities in Florida. Tampa and Miami, Miami, Miami's doing about the same as the, as the, as the national average. Tampa's doing a little bit better, but it's not going gangbusters. If the real estate bubble bursts in the U.S., is the crash likely to be more widespread than the crash of 2007? Yes, I believe so, because there's more debt now. There's more debt in the system. And it's for that, and I say that for, for that, for that reason, and that reason alone. There's just more debt. And that, and that's what's, and that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna destroy us, is the debt. Like what's happening over in Europe, for example? Europe has had negative interest rates for what, six straight years now? Why do they have negative interest rates? Because they can't handle the debt. 
Now, having negative interest rates, do you think that's good for the, good for the economy? It's terrible for the economy. So they keep adding on more debt, adding on more debt, negative interest rates, negative interest rates, and pretty soon that's going to come to roost. Just go back and look at 100 years of history of any country and see how many times they've had negative interest rates. Why is that? Because it's totally manipulated, and, and, and it's not sustainable. And, that, and that's what's going to happen. Oh, I think, there's a, I think there's a big change coming, you know, in the next year, two, or three, or maybe even four. Huge changes where, you know, there's going to be a, a massive, you know, decline in the price of assets. You know, economies are going to adjust. And, it, and it's, all going to depend, it's all going to depend on market forces, not some evil wizard in uh, Geneva, Europe, you know, pulling the strings that's going to destroy the world economy so that uh, all the rich guys can own everything and the poor people get nothing. What is the U-Haul index? The U- I'm so glad you asked that because this, this, is the, this is an index that's widely quoted but has almost no value whatsoever. For right now, let me tell you what the, what the U-Haul index is, is this. Let's, let's say you live in Los Angeles and you want to move to Dallas, Texas. What's it cost to rent, you know, a 26-foot trunk and truck in L.A. to get to Dallas? Right now, in, in, in September 2021, that cost was 5700 bucks to go from L.A. to Dallas versus going from, you know, going from Dallas to L.A., the cost was only 1000 bucks. So what does that tell you? Well, you know, what does that tell you? That tells you everybody's mo- that that five times as many people are moving out of L.A. and into Dallas as a, as are as are moving from Dallas into the United States. Okay, wow, wow, that's really interesting. You better get out of California then, right? Wrong. L.A. real estate prices are appreciating faster than Dallas real estate prices. So how can you explain that? That's why it's a total BS indicator. And I've seen that over the years, and people like to quote it because they have nothing else to talk about it, talk about for some reason, and it's the, um, the, somehow they think, you know, that's a key indicator to watch, which it is not. So there's really no data there to analyze and, and draw oh. conclusions from. I mean, it, okay, and, and let's say right now from San Francisco to Dallas, if everybody's leaving California, right? I mean, we've seen this over the years. This just isn't now. I've seen this the last 10, 20 years. San Francisco to Dallas right now to rent a 26-foot U-Haul truck costs you seven grand. To go from Dallas to San Francisco costs you 900 bucks. San Francisco a real estate is appreciating at the same rate that Dallas real estate is appreciating. I mean, so, you know, how, how do you make those two, how does that all jive? It doesn't. So, in other words, it's a bogus. What value does it have? None. Zero from, from, from an from a economic decision-making standpoint. I mean, normally people look at that and go, get the hell out of San Francisco and move to Dallas. Cause, cause real estate's crashing in San Francisco and booming in Dallas. And that's not the case. Not the case. I saw a demographic map of Canada that showed people were moving out of central Canada to either the west or east coast. Is that happening in the U.S.? No, in fact, just the opposite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just the opposite, I would say. Because that historically, the fastest appreciating cities in the United States are on both on both coasts, the East Coast and the West Coast. Now, areas in the middle, you know, like the two, the two key indicators, two cities that I follow, major cities I follow, that are, that, that are in the, you know, flyover states are Dallas and Denver. And normally, you know, the, during, the last, during the last real estate boom, they went up a little and down a little. Nothing, nothing major. Both cities. This time, Dallas and Denver real estate have, have just skyrocketed to the upside. So, you know, based on what, what typically happens historically, I think Dallas, so pe- people are moving into those cities right now, or real estate wouldn't be appreciating at the rate it's appreciating. So for some reason, they're moving there. And, and, and thus, you know, the high rate of appreciation of real estate. And when the bus comes, I think everybody's, I think those cities are, gonna, are going to suffer some of the biggest declines. Because historically, people don't want to live in Dallas and Denver. They want to live on the coast. I mean, that's just what, the way people are. That's where people migrate to. And now they're all migrating to the Midwest. And I just think that that, that there will, will also be, be transitory. Is there a bull market in pure blood? I hear there is, but I can't confirm it. 
cannot confirm. I heard the other day that um, unvaccinated people, the sperm from unvaccinated people, has increased by 400% in the last year. Because, you know, let, let's say you're a woman that needs to be fertilized with an egg. Do you want, do you want the sperm from a, a, a pure blood? Who's not been vaccinated and is healthy, or a or a vaccinated person who could be contaminated with these viruses. I'm also waiting for the day. I'm also waiting for the day to when you know that that what's what's the value of of unvaccinated blood going to be worth in the in the in the years ahead? I think it's going to be worth a lot more money, you know, than it has been in the past. I heard a story the other day where somebody, some rich guy. You know, he needed transfusions, and he couldn't find he, he he couldn't be sure that the blood he was using the transfusion was pure blood, meaning unvaccinated, meaning blood from an unvaccinated person. And he was he was willing to fly his private jet down to Mexico to 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 get in, uh, blood infusions from unvaccinated blood because he could confirm that it was in fact good. He was willing to go to that expense to get unvaccinated blood. So it makes sense to me that this is going to happen, and so that you know, again, supply and demand. Even though there's, even though the the, the supply of unvaccinated blood is um, is 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 still great, because even though the U.S. government reports that that um, 75% of all all U.S. citizens have been vaccinated, I don't believe that for a second. I, I believe at best it's 50%. So there's still a lot of people around that that, that are pure blood. Is there a real pandemic of stupidity? Yes, and, and there always has been. It's even more so now, though, because they, they've instilled all this fear in everybody that you know, if, if if you don't get the if you don't get the vaccine, you're going to die. And most people that only listen to the mainstream media, you know, have bought into that, and it's absolutely unfounded fear. For one thing, everybody, the mainstream media is a is a government propaganda mouthpiece that's what it is and what what we have done in this country is we have destroyed trust in the u.s government in big business and in the pharmaceutical industry and in the healthcare industry with this with this covid scam thing that's going on right now and i i don't think that we're going back to normal the old normal for a long time because trust takes a lot of long time to build up and you, it's easily lost, and I think it's going to be decades before it comes back, if, if it even does, to where it was, to where it was, you know, before COVID. How about leaving us with some health tips and some wisdom? Oh, some health tips and some wisdom. Let me see what I've got here for you guys. I know it's it's what I do. It's the thing I do. I, uh, the um um. Because I don't want, I, I, I just, I just don't want to keep giving you the same stuff over and over and over again. The, um, I'll tell you something that's good. I'll tell you some wisdom, and it's really changed my life. The more I keep, the more I kick shitty people out of my life, the happier I am. And I don't care if it's family, guys. You got to get rid of toxic people out of your life, and things become infinitely, infinitely better for you. Just do that. And surround yourself by good people. Good people. The, um, the, um, things like, you know, health. You know, that my wife doesn't drink alcohol and, you know, I, I only, I was a very occasional social drinker. You know, I, I don't drink alcohol anymore at all. Avoiding alcohol has, it, that even though some sort of said, you know, a glass of wine or two, you know, doesn't hurt every day, which I don't know. You got to avoid alcohol, guys. You got to avoid things like alcohol. You got to avoid things like drugs. Normally, you know, those produce outcomes that you, that you're not going to be happy with. Not at all. That another thing is, and, and I speak mainly for us guys, because that's what I am. The, the older you get, your body stops producing things it needs, like human growth hormone and testosterone. There are things that keep you young. Keep your body, body strong. Keep you young. They're not addictive. They're produced naturally in your body. But as you get older, there's lower and lower and lower levels of these, and they need to be supplemented by, you know, supplemented, you know, with, with food, with, with medicines, or whatever. I'm 74 years old. I haven't spent one penny of my retirement savings, 
you know, that, that I save for retirement. One, because I have a good income. One, I I'll always live within my means. But I have decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to be researching things, things like human growth hormone and testosterone. And if I need supplements, that's where I'm going to spend my money. Because that's just not cheap, guys. But the, 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 what, the results that come from that, and they're not dangerous, it's amazing. So I'm going to spend my wealth, I'm going to spend my money on wealth. I mean, on health, I'm sorry. I'm not worrying about, worrying about making another million dollars at the expense of my health. I don't, I don't need to make any more money. I mean, am I, the, am I a super rich guy? No, not at all. Am I comfortable financially? Absolutely. One, because I live within my means. And, and two, I'd rather spend it on health. Because I want to go out like a shooting star. Like a shooting star. All of a sudden, when I'm 90 years old, you're going to see Robert Campbell flashing through the sky, and then he's just going to disappear. And my, and I learned this, learned this lesson from my dad. My dad was 91 years old and, and healthy as a horse, uh, until the age of 91 when he contacted pneumonia, which is typically a death sentence for somebody 90 years old, over 90 years old. But when he was 85, I found out, my dad was an ex-builder, Marine in, in the World War, in, in the Second World War, fought in the, fought in the South Pacific. So he was a, he was a, a, a tough guy. You know, and I kind of take after him in that regard. He got to be 85 years old, and Mom told me that Dad was taking sleeping pills to sleep at night. So I got in front of his face right away and said, Dad, those are addictive. you got to stop taking those things. He looked me in the eye and said, Bob, I'm 84 year, 85 years old. Do you think I give a F whether I get addicted to sleeping pills at this point in my life? And I went, Dad, you're, you're always smart about things. And he's absolutely right. Once you get to be 80, 85 years old, if you're taking something that's going to improve your life substantially, where you can still actively do things like hit a baseball 300 feet or run a 100-yard dash or do other things that people 20 or 30 years, you know, uh, uh, younger than you can't even do, that, is that worth it? If you know that you're going to, even if you know you're going to die at 95, absolutely. It's all about the quality of life, everybody. It's the qual- so whatever you can do that won't kill you. I mean, would I have done these, these kind of, be looking at these kind of things when I was younger? No, because I didn't need them. I was healthy, I was athletic, I could run, I could do lots of things, more things than I can now. But when you start to get to be 74 years old, I mean, I'm not complaining one bit because, you know, I can do things that people, you know, 20 years my junior can't do, but still, I want to go out and play in a in a over 65 hardball league, you know, fast pitch, hardball at age 65 and be able to hit a ball over the left field fence. And and that takes that that takes a certain kind of strength and health to be able to do that. And and that's what I'm focused on more right now than I am, you know, trying to make another million bucks in the market. The or or making another million doing this because that's the quality of life. And it just makes you feel wonderful, guys. By the way, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm producing a, I'm creating a 30 page report on, on health, you know, that, you know, what I've learned about, what I've learned about health and fitness in the last 50 years. And believe me, I know more, as much as anybody, because I, I walk the walk. And I, so that gives me the ability to talk the talk. And I'm going to create a 30 page report that I'm going to share with all my followers. Here's exactly what I've learned. Here's exactly what I do. You know, I'll take off my shirt and show you. Here I am, 74 years old. Do I look like a 74-year-old guy? No, exactly. How would you like to look, how would you like to start looking more like me? Yes, I would. Here's a 30-page report to show you exactly what I do. It's 295 bucks. And the reason I charge 295 bucks is because if you give somebody something for free, they don't value it. So I told, I've been telling my buddies, I said, you know, I don't care if I, I don't sell one of those things. And they all look at me and go, oh, you're going to sell a lot of them, Bob. Trust me. And, then, and so that's something I want to share with people as I get older. You know, how to stay healthy, how to stay fit. And, the, and, and also not what it does for your body, what it does for your brain. You know, that life, life is an is a ongoing learning experience. It never ends. And, for example, when I came up with that, that graph that I showed people in my last timing letter that showed the, the correlation between mortgage rates and the rate of inflation going back 45 years, I don't know that anybody has ever done that. But I still have the brains, the imagination, the courtesy, and the curiosity to put something like that together, and I even amazed myself. I go, I didn't know that a month ago. And I went, wow, 
a three percentage point premium premium is what is, is the historical correlation. And and now what are we at? Now rates are you know more inflation six and rates are three. Now we're minus three. That's not sustainable, guys. Either inflation is going to come way down, or mortgage rates are going to come way up, or they're going to meet somewhere in between. Which is, you know, most likely, you know, rates are going to go, rates are going to go screaming higher. And if you want, if inflation gets out of control, I mean, high levels of inflation, double digit, like we had during the 70s, the, the U.S. dollar can crash, which is the U.S. currency, and the the only recourse that uh, um, um, Treasury Secretary, um, no, I think it was Fed Chairman Paul Volcker had to, you know, had to do in 1980 was he raised interest rates up to 20 percent. That was to save the dollar. Or, or hyperinflation could have occurred in the United States. Could you imagine? And, and mortgage rates went to went to eighteen percent during that time. Could you imagine the state of real estate right now, anywhere in the world, let alone the United States, if mortgage rates were at eighteen percent? What that would do to the to the price of housing? It would be a collapse like you never saw it before. But the reason that it wasn't a, a total collapse back then is I think back then in the United States we had uh, I think our our national debt was. Oh goodness, you know, it was less than a trillion dollars. Less than a trillion dollars. What is it today? Almost 30. So, things have changed. You, you gotta be careful when you compare, you know, one era with the next because there's, there's, there's different variables in there that have to be looked at. Like, can you raise, if, if they raised, you know, interest rates, had to start cranking up interest rates to save the dollar and stop inflation, and, and the U.S. government owes 30 trillion dollars in debt, Debt servicing would go up from 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 ten percent of the national budget, which it is now, probably twenty or thirty. So that that means going to have to print another trillion dollars a year or more just to cover interest, you know, paying interest on the national debt, or or, or tell the or tell the coupon holders to pound sand. Which you do that, then the whole thing's going to collapse. That's why what they're going to do, everybody. Not giving this a lot of thought. Here's what the future is going to look like, as best I can see it. They're going to revalue gold to a big number, big number, 25000 maybe even 50000 to back the U.S. dollar to save the debt, which will save the system. That's what I think is going to happen. That's why I think the premier, and I've thought this for years, the, the, the premier wealth asset going forward is going to be gold. How can people find out more about your book and newsletter and your upcoming events? Okay, they can go to my website, which is realestatetiming.com, just like it sounds, realestatetiming.com, and they could, they can read a sample of my, uh, my timing letter, they can subscribe to my timing letter if they want, they can buy my book if they want, I, the, and, uh, I've been doing this, uh, that, I've been publishing this now, um, it'll be, it'll be 20 years next month. So that, you know, I'm not a newbie to all this, I'm not, I'm not some, you know, 35 year old kid, that's made a million dollars in real estate in the last five years during this booming housing market, and now and now think of myself as a as a genius. No way. But I've been around the real estate market my entire life. My dad was a home builder in Southern California and developer for 55 years. I was born with a skill saw in one hand, so I know the industry as well as anybody, and that and that's what really helps qualify me to do what I do. Also, I want to leave you guys with one thing. Do you know what the best best defense, the best thing you can do to protect yourself against inflation is to have a good job or a good skill or a good source of income. Whatever you do, everybody, be good at what you do. I don't care if you're a carpenter or a framer. If you're the best framer, one of the best framers in Southern California, I don't care if inflation, if inflation is at, is at 20% and they're only building 1,000 homes a year in Southern California. Uh, you're going to you're going to be one of the guys that's framing those homes or whatever else that you do. You got to be really good at it, and you got to work on increasing your skill set, and that's within your control. Because when you're good at what you do, regardless how how hard economic times become, you're at the top of the list when it comes to the guys like who do I want to hire? I want to hire Jim Goddard. He's the best real estate. He he's the best uh, radio host in the United in Canada. Yeah, I know that. So we have an opening. We want Jim. Or we're going to can the guy, some, some doof that's not half as good as Jim, but that we currently, that we currently hire and hire Jim to do that. So that's your best defense. A steady source of income is, it, it, you know, that you earn because of your own, um, um, because of your own efforts. Because cash flow becomes 
incredibly, incredibly important during inflation. You can't lose your job. So you have rising prices and no job. You're doomed, everybody. So you got to keep your job, and the way you keep your job is you get really, really good at what you do. For, for example, for example, and I, I'm not only just talking the talk. I try to be the best real estate timer in the world. And when I walk down the street and somebody sees me, I want them to say, that's Robert Campbell. He's the best real estate timer in the whole world. And, if, and, and my attitude is, if they're not saying that, they don't know what they're talking about. And, it, and that's, just not, that's just not idle boasting. I, I work hard to do what I do, and I'm good at what I do. That's why I, will always, that's why I can be 74 years old and I haven't touched a penny, one penny of my retirement savings because I still have a good income coming in, and I don't need to spend it. I, you know, a friend of mine told me the other day, though, he said, Bob, listen, man, I know who you are. And I've, every dollar I've ever made, I've always saved 20 cents. And he goes, you're 74 years old right now. I know you're great. You're in perfect health. But you know how much of your money you're going to take to the grave with you? <laughs> that opened my eyes, Jim. Uh, that was an eye-opener for me. That's why I'm mentioning it. I remembered that. And I went like, like, like you know what? He's right. So that's why I'm going to start spending some of my money. And I'm going to start spending it on health to stay healthier so I look better, so I feel better, so I'm stronger. So, so I have even a, you know, more positive attitude than I do now, that I'm even more confident than I have right now, than I am right now. But you know what, guys? You gotta spend it. If you make it, you gotta spend it on yourself. Just don't be screwed and, 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 you know, you know, that, that, you know, when you're dead, you know, they shovel all the money into your coffin with you. What's the point of that? There is no point. So at least spend half of it on something or give half of it away. Give it away to some good cause. If you're not going to use it on yourself, give it away. I give money away. That Where I give money away is I don't give my kids any money because much money, just give them money because that doesn't help make them successful. If, if, if they can't, if they can't watch, use me as an example and, and earn it on their own, they'll never value it. But who I give you know, practically all my gift money to, I give it, give it away to organizations that, that rescue dogs and find them good homes. And, and when, when my wife and I die, most of, our, most of our net worth is going to those kind of organizations because I know when the angels are taking me away to heaven, I know that I will have left the earth a better place than I found it. I mean, that's how I feel about dogs. I mean, and, but what a worthy, what a worthy, worthy cause. Giving kids money, giving your kids each a bunch of money. What's that going to do? Mm, I don't know. What? They buy better drugs? Probably. Or they go out and buy a new car that they, they never could have afforded on their own? Yeah, probably. Don't end up wasting it because they don't, because they don't value it because they didn't earn it. But so there's a lot of little things. Here's part, that's part of the wisdom thing, guys, that, you know, I'd like to share with you that I've learned. And as I, you know, I'm closer to the end than I am the beginning. That's for sure. I doubt I'm going to live to be 150 years old. The, um, but so you, you start learning things like that and start giving the money away. Just a worthy cause. I carry, I carry $5 bills in my car in glove box. And every time I see a, a, um, a homeless person on the side of the street with a little sign that says, please help, I need food, I give them five bucks. And you know what? I'm a cheapskate. I'm going to step up. I'm going to make it ten bucks. And the, um, because five bucks is nothing. I know it buys them lunch, but that's fine. And I don't care that people go, oh, they're alcoholics, they'll just buy a bottle of vodka. I don't give a crap what they spend the money on. If I get, they're not out there by choice. That's not their first choice, what they want to be. But pretty soon you start giving people money like that, and you know who it makes feel better, guys? It's you. They look you in the eyes, and they go, especially when you give them a five or a ten, they go, because most people only give them a one, they look at you and say, thank you very much, sir. Is that worth five bucks? It's worth a million bucks. I tried to give somebody, I was downtown San Diego, I tried to give some homeless person that was standing up, and I, I, I went by him at, and I saw him, and it looked like he was having trouble, and I came back, and I tapped him on the shoulder and said, Sir, um, I'd like to give you ten bucks just to help you out. And he looked at me and said, I, I really appreciate you saying that, but he, he went, I'm okay. I, I don't need it. Wow. Some people even have pride like that. I don't know what his situation was. He wouldn't even let me give him 10 bucks. But you got to help out your fellow man that's in need, you guys. you got to take care of you got to take care.
care of people that need help. You got to take care of dogs that need help. Do something, do something like that, and give it and, and, and avoid the middleman. I will never give give to Red Cross because I think that there's a lot of middlemen that are making way too much money skimming off the top. But if you if you just hand cash to a bum on the street or somebody that's homeless, or you give money to an organization that that takes care of homeless animals and finds them good homes, that's as direct as it can get, guys. And all of a sudden, now you're doing good. Now you're doing good. So you've been. You've been blessed with success, you know, for, a, for, a, for a, a, a large portion of your life. Now you start giving it away. You start spending it on yourself, but also you start giving it away to good causes. So that's my wisdom. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you very much, Jim. You take care. My guest has been Robert Campbell, author of Timing the Real Estate Market and the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter online at realestatetiming.com. He was speaking to us from San Diego. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and Robert Campbell. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, you have some big patent news for us. Well, yeah, we filed uh, about seven seven new uh, patents on the national phase patent application. And, uh, you know, we covered off a few things we hadn't. One was black mass. And uh, graphite, so uh, we, graphite recovery. So we, you know, that's a, that was a big plus for us. Uh, it builds our patent portfolio and uh, shows a much stronger company and a much more protected company at the end of the day. And uh, you know, it also has a treatment for the electrolyte. And the electrolyte is, uh, you know, quite a dangerous uh, material to handle. It's in the black mass because it doesn't come out. It's ground up, and uh, it's part of the black mass. So you got to get that out. You don't want that going out with the uh, with the uh, product that you're producing, the cathode material. So, uh, yeah, that was a that was a that was a big stride forward for us, and uh, it's uh, you know one of the things that uh, the company keeps on top of. I know there hasn't been a lot of press releases lately, but uh, we're still, you know, hurry up and wait. And uh, so the, uh, you know, we move ahead on other fronts, and uh, this is one of the fronts we're moving on. You know, you can spend uh, millions of dollars on patents, but uh, at the end of the day, they're worth it. So uh, it's uh, it's a it's a thing that the company has done from the get go. Uh, patents were their, their major focal point. Uh, in the beginning of this uh, whole exercise, and uh, our second patent uh, went through in 81 days. 81 days is a record for organic chemistry. So uh, you know, it's uh, that tells you nobody else was poking around the same area we were. So uh, there was no conflict there. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a good feeling, Jim. And but I really want to talk about is I've been getting a lot of mail lately on why the stock price is falling. Well, the stock price has been falling since it was uh, up at the 280 range, and I've been talking about predator trading. Although I keep getting the backlash like there's no tomorrow, and supposedly from people that are shareholders and don't want me talking about it, and you know yaddy yaddy is all he talks about is predator trading. But I'm going to talk about it today. Because since we've been listed on the QB, we uh, they have a partial uptick rule, and that partial rule uh, includes the reporting of uh, any short trades. And in the last 30 days, uh, we've been close to 50% of the volume has been uh, short trades. 
And uh, you can figure that out. That's millions of shares that are created out of the air. These are shares that don't exist. Most of the time, they're probably probably not even borrowed. And, uh, you know, they just willy-nilly short. Certainly in Canada, that's the way it is. There's no short rule, so there's no rules. Although some people report short positions, it, you can't follow the short the uh, short uh, area where the stock is being reported because it's uh, it's sparse and uh, and patchy, and uh, it doesn't report all the trades. And we know that uh, it's certainly uh, happening. So uh, you can recognize short trading in the market, predator trading, we call it. And uh, that is, uh, if you ever see uh, when they're lo- using the algorithms, which they do every day, they uh, they might have five trades of 500 to 1,000 shares all in one second. And uh, that is, uh, that's the algorithm kicking in. And th- they do that to take the price down. And, uh, you know, it's always on the short side that they're selling it. And uh, they knock out the bids. So, uh that's that's one of the things that happen. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is in the OTC, as I mentioned, uh, we got 50 almost 50 percent of the volume in the last 20 trading days that uh, has been short trades. Now that works out to millions of shares in that trading period, and that's just on the U.S. And that's like I say, uh, shares that are created out of the uh, thin air. And they don't exist, uh, you know, they just happen to be uh, the short, you know, the, they're shorting the stock. And why are they doing that? Well, I call it a predator raid. What they're doing is forcing the price down because they're covering their short positions that were done higher ever since the 280 range. You know, and uh, that's the, uh, people say we don't have enough volume, but we got enough volume to attract short traders, that's for sure. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, that's, that helped bring the price down. That helped bring the price down from $2 to where it's at today. And, uh, now these guys are gonna come out with millions, uh, hundreds of millions of profits here. Because, uh, they've been shorting a big position and now they're covering. And, uh, so when they cover, they, uh, they get the difference. So if they cover at 50 cents, for example, and they shorted it at uh, two dollars, and it's a million shares. That's a million and a half bucks in their pocket. And if it's uh, ten million shares, that's fifteen million dollars in their pocket. And just keep going up multiples. And uh, you know, I've always felt that we had close to uh, fifty to a hundred million shares in the short position against us. And uh, that you know, proving that is a different story. But I can now show you, which is going to be attached to this report, the OTC short positions. And uh, there's at least 20 days in there, so uh, you can look at it. You know, you don't have to, you know, send me letters telling me I'm a liar and I'm this and I'm that and everything else. That's what the, the predators do. But it happens to be true, and it shows up there. So. Uh, why are they pushing it down now? Because they do know that we've got the goods, that the company's well financed, that the company has patents, that the company has verification from independent sources, you know, peer reviewed papers out there, two of them. And a peer review means that maybe four or five different people, uh, in different locations go through our patent application and look at it and everything else. And, uh, and if they approve it, then the paper is written on it. So uh, it's not something that, uh, you know, one guy looks at and says, yeah or no. It's, a se- it's several, it's handed to several people. So, uh, you know, and the patent application is there, you know, there should be no doubt that the company has these patents and that, that, that they actually do what they say they're going to do. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating to see this happening. But what they're trying to do, I, I, uh, and they have already mentioned, is forced capitulation. And you can see that in the uh, last three days of the uh, percentage of, uh, of short trades. You can see that they are, uh, that, the, uh, that we have capitulation going on. Not just capitulation, some people are selling for tax service purposes. 
some people are exercising warrants and maybe selling them, and uh, but it doesn't account for all the volume. So uh, that's the uh, that's what's happening. These guys are. Who do you think's buying that stock? And they, when it gets down to these levels, it's going to be the predators that are going to buy it to cover off their shorts, to crystallize their profits, and um, you know, and, real, and actually realizing that the company is in good shape. It's not something that's going to get pushed down the drain. It's something that's going to bounce back. So I'd like to remind shareholders that uh, we've been through this. Uh, we were through this at two cents. Can you believe it? Where tens of millions of dollars were lost when it went jumped from two to thirty-five by short traders, and uh, they haven't forgotten that. And then they shorted the hell out of it at the twenty-cent range, trying to prevent any kind of. Uh, financing so we could advance the company but we worked our way through it and uh, then they got caught on the upswing to 280 well that hurt and uh, but not all of them covered some of them got deep pockets and uh, they didn't cover their position but now they want to cover because they see that the uh, electric car the battery manufacturing and the uh, recycling are going to be the big movers next year and we want to be part of that. So uh, we're in good shape. I took a lot of criticism for raising money at a dollar, uh, $20 million, but it's put us in the, uh, it gives us the uh, opportunity to put the commercial plant into production. And uh, so that's something that can kill a company. If you can't get the thing into production, it's not going to happen. I get criticism on some of the way, on some of the things that I say on the, uh, on the, uh, on these podcasts, but you got to remember, these are all from the uh, from the shoulder, and uh, so the uh, big big effort right now is forcing the companies to uh, capitulate, and I can see that starting to happen. I saw it happen that in the twenty cent range. Uh, you know, people that I was in contact with were selling shares, and uh, at twenty cents, twenty five cents, and uh, they missed out on the big run. And uh, some of them have sizable positions, but uh, you know, you keep reading the bullboards, you're going to get depressed, and you, all you're going to hear is what the company's not doing. I get letters from these kinds of guys, and like one guy says, "Why aren't you uh, telling the truth? What's what are you hiding?" Well, Jesus Christ, I'm trying to be as transparent as I can. We've got an independent lab doing all the work that's got their reputation on the line. And, uh, you know, so everything that we say is true. It's not that it's, uh, there's no bullshit in it. And, uh, you know, we can uh, actually, uh, actually uh, prove everything that's being said. And it's being said by a third party who has no interest in the uh, patents or no interest in the shares of the company because they have to write reports. They have to be independent. And, uh, so the, uh, so what I'm trying to say, guys, is that this route is not because the company's lacking something. It's because predators are making it appear the company's lacking something, going on the boards and paying their henchmen to uh, post articles on there that are just pure and sheer BS. And, uh, you know, the uh, if you want to go there and do your uh, homework, I, there's nothing I can do to stop you. I'm just... I'm not saying that you should be buying the dips, but it's starting to look like that's coming right, coming very close. And, uh, you know, because the, uh, that's up to you. We give you all the information. We give you the transparency. If you don't believe in the patents, if you don't believe what's published out there that has to go through regulatory approvals and everything else at some time, uh, we're not publishing anything that can be backlash on the company. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, this whole bloody, uh, market route is, uh, caused by the predators, the ones that, uh, some of you have been protecting, uh, thinking that they, you know, that you're better off to be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand. But, you know, I've never been that way. I'm the first guy to ever write anything about predator trading. And, uh, we were in some, you know, some newspapers and everything else. And, uh, so I've got a good, uh, good eye for seeing predator trading. It's not just us. There's hundreds of companies out there, and uh, lots of the ones I watch are, uh, you know, are getting a lot of predator trading, whether they're ten cents or five cents, and uh, you know they uh, they can't seem to get out of a box. And uh, 
you know, eventually uh, they hope to kill the company and pick up all the marbles when it's all over. But, uh, you know, that may not happen. didn't happen when Amy at two cents, when Amy was under a debt of over a million dollars. And uh, we did our uh, first proof of concept, and the stock bounced to uh, 35, and it stayed in that 20-cent range for the next four years. Well, we raised the money to uh, file the patents to uh, actually advance the uh, process, and uh, and then I get a lot of ridicule for uh, the length of time it takes. Well, guess what? When you do R and D, you find something that could be better. So you got to go back to the table and and uh, work that into the program because you're going to file for patents sooner or later. Or you're going to go into production sooner or later, and it's a, it's a big job if you wait till you go into production to start making changes in the plant. It's better to do it before. And uh, you know, I've been talking about deliveries, and I've you know blamed part of it on COVID. Now you can blame part of it on the flooding here in BC because we've got at least five pieces that are coming from uh, Ontario. And uh, the trucking from Ontario is pretty much uh, at a standstill. But we still think that we can probably get going in uh, mid-February and uh, on the plant, which means that we hope that we've got the, the, the plant to put together by the end of this year and uh, start on it in January. So, uh, And then that's going to be a game changer. We're getting an interest now from a lot of the OEMs, that are some of the biggest ones out there. And uh, we've been returning product to them, and uh, now we're, they're talking about they like the concept of uh, having a plant at the uh, Gigafactory, which was our, for, you know, which is our first moving uh, uh, business plan. People say we don't have a business plan. Well, every time I publish a, a business plan, or I even publish results or anything else, the next thing I know, I got a half a dozen companies out there claiming the same thing. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's I'm not as secret as, as anybody else, or you're not getting that information from anybody else, but you're getting a lot of information from us. And uh, that should be, uh, if you're really following the company, as you say you are, then what, what changes your mind when the stock price goes down? You don't think about predator trading. You think about what the hell's management doing? What the hell's going on? What's wrong with the company? I mean... Hey, that's not the way to go. You know, I can see this thing coming back out of here very soon, and hopefully uh, before the uh, uh, December's over with, we'll start to rally, or even before. So uh, there we are, guys. That's uh, you know, I'm trying to answer uh, you know 30 or 40 emails I got yesterday. And uh, I know you don't like me talking about predator trading, but now maybe you should. Give your head a shake and take a look at the fact that, hey, there is predator trading going on. It's not small. It's millions of shares. And, uh, you know, could I think it could be 10, could be 40, could be 50, could be 100 million shares that are sitting there out there short. So, uh, you know, this is a good time for uh, Reddit or any of these groups to take a look at the company because, uh, you know, if we can trap the shorts, they can push it up. And uh, that'll just mean that they come back in right at the top of that market and push it down. So, uh, you know, the reality is I think you've got the, the best, we've got one of the best deals out there and when it comes to recycling. So uh, I wouldn't get panicky about what's happening in the company. That's pretty transparent. We just published our, uh, our audited financials, and uh, I know they're always three months behind, but that's the way it is. I mean, you got to, uh, that's, you got to have time to publish these things, and, uh, so the, the regulatory authorities, uh, give you three months to do that. And, uh, so anyway, guys, I wouldn't worry about the company's shape. They're sitting with $22 million. They've got patents and patent applications in all over the world. And, uh, you know, they're gradually getting done and coming in. So, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, you have to uh, worry about what the company or the shape the company's in. You don't have to worry about what we have. So, uh, you know, start looking at the predator trading. That might give you a better idea of what's happening in the market than, uh, you know, coming back and uh, blaming management for uh, the stock falling down. 
and uh, you know, hey, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't, I understand that you guys don't play in the market. Is I'm not necessarily playing in the market, but I watch the market. I watch specifically the market in Amy, and I know when the predator trading is happening. So uh, I can see it on the trades. I can see the houses involved. I see the fact that it's done mostly on the, uh, on the, not on the uh, main board, which is the TSX Venture Exchange, but it's done on the platforms. And I don't know how many platforms are out there, but they've got to be 12 to 15 platforms out there. So a lot of the hanky packy happens on the uh, platforms. You'll see that, uh, you know, the stock is, uh, is last at, uh, let's say, uh, 60 cents on the uh, on the uh, venture exchange, and yet all of a sudden it goes down to 55. And uh, you haven't seen anything move on the venture exchange except updating the trades. That's from the platforms. So anyway, uh, guys, you, if you really want to watch the market, if you really are putting your heart and soul and your money and your investment into the company, then watch the trading that goes on. Because that's the best indication of uh, why the company's going down. Why do you think every time we put out a good press release, the stock goes down? Why is that? I mean, today, the uh, we put out a press release. At least we didn't go down, but we didn't go up at any pace either. So uh, it's, uh, it's it's you know, our, the markets in Canada are controlled by the predator traders. And uh, until that changes, until we get an uptick rule back here, this is going to continue. But there is ways to uh, beat them out on their own game, and I'm always looking at that. Have a good weekend, guys. I'm sorry uh, for those that be, will be offended, but I imagine if anybody's offended by it, they're a predator trade, trader or they work for a predator trader and post for a predator trader. So uh, it's... Uh, that's kind of uh, where we're at today, guys, and uh, have a good weekend. Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what's the company all about? The company is a uh, critical metals company that uh, is uh, first to develop the process for treating very low grades, which is what the U.S. has, of manganese, which is a critical metal that's required. Uh, if you're all the steel making, you've got to have at least uh, close to 10 or uh, not 10 percent, but uh, you have to have at least 10 pounds per ton of uh, of manganese in it to give it ductibility and strength. Otherwise, you've got a piece of steel that shatters, and uh, so that's critical for, uh, especially for uh, all the uh, U.S. forces. It's critical for building buildings. It's critical for you just look around you, see how much metal is out there, and you can see that it's critical for all of that. And uh, so we've uh, we've taken that process and developed a process for recycling lithium-ion batteries because the chemistry chemistries turned out to be the same on our proof, proof of concept, and uh, we haven't looked back. I mean, uh, it's uh, you know we've got a uh, situation going where you know we're getting big interest, guys. It's as fa- simple as that. We're getting big interest, and we've got lots of new NDAs that are signed. But uh, I'm not, of course, we're not doing any deals. We don't know what the end result is going to look like. We have to know how we're going to cut the uh, the onion so that uh, everybody profits and everybody benefits from our process. Uh, you know, right now there's so much. Lithiums through the roof. That won't go on forever. And, uh, you know, cobalt is being cut back and, uh, nickel is increasing in some cases. So, uh, you know, it's got all kinds of different, uh, things that are working on it. Different, uh, synergies that, uh, can create, could create problems, uh, for a, an early, a very early, uh, uh, the agreement with anybody on uh, pricing of the materials and everything else because that can change in a heartbeat. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have to know exactly what we have and how we're going to cut the onion and then we can approach these people. We're asking now, we're being asked now to, uh, you know, what do we want? How do we do this? Well, licensing or joint ventures are, are the big thing for us. 
And uh, if you want to go find anything else, we have a, out. We have a lot of transparency on our process and everything on the uh, AmericanManganeseInc.com. And uh, you can also uh, phone the company here at uh, 778-574-4444, or you and and you, or you can uh, email me at l r e a u g h at a m y m n dot com. And remember, we're traded on the uh, the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol A M Y. We're traded in the U Q B board in the U S under A M Y Z F. And we're traded on uh, in Frankfurt under the symbol A two A M. So uh, those are the things that you have to look for, and. Uh, I wish you a good weekend. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. I'm Jim Goddard. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Our conversation took place on December 3rd. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of House Street Media Incorporated.